Uh, greetings, dear church. It's so nice to have everybody here so we can worship the Lord together. In this routine of our life, when we have these evening services, sometimes we get so used to it that we think it will always be this way, but as we all know very well that they could all very quickly end and we would, might not be able to gather again. So thank you everybody for coming today and taking these, uh, these days and using them for our advantage so we can learn from the Word of God. The topic of my sermon today that I want to talk about is remaining faithful in our a everyday routines. We heard a little bit about that uh, from Eli, about how there's no coincidences with God, that he, is, he always has everything planned out for us. But there's so much uh, mundane things that happen to us daily that sometimes we get used to it and we don't, uh, we, we don't take anything from that. We think, oh, we'll, we'll wait for something really special to happen in our lives, like there's maybe a, a special conference that we go to. Like next week, we would have a conference here every year uh, a youth conference, and everybody waits for events like that, but this year, sadly, we don't have that conference. Or there's some kind of special, very important speaker that comes, and you, you want to go and see that person. Or we have a wedding, something very important that happens. We also have sometimes like graduations, things that are very important to us. But these all things, they come and they go, but the mundane, the regular, the daily things, they remain. And those little things that we do during... Um, what we call the everyday things, that's what forms us who we are as a person. I would like to continue our, studying in, uh, our study in Philippians chapter 4. We are getting to towards the end of this letter. Last time when we looked at the section that talks about anxiety, we saw how God will guard us, our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, and we saw how God will keep us from uh, worrying about things that are out of our control. But we didn't really get to see how God will do that in our life. We saw that God will guard our hearts from, uh, and minds through Christ Jesus. And today, I would like to f focus on what we have to do on our part so that we will not have to be, wor uh, will not be worrying about things that uh, are in this world because we know that God controls everything. Let's read these verses together. We'll, we'll be reading chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Just two verses, but they're very important, very powerful verses that talk about how we need to control our thoughts and how we need to put it into action. So Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything, any virtue, and any, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. So once uh, Amer American inventor Henry Ford said the following about thinking, he said, Thinking is the hardest job you will ever have. That's why so few people engage in it. For me personally, I'd much rather spend a week of hard working labor rather than spend a few hours in preparing even a message like this because it's so not only physically tiring, but it's mentally, it drains you because you have to think, you have to uh, force yourself to do something that's not all we don't normally do because thinking is very important to us because that's what God God created us distinct from animals because we can think. And the statistics shows that on a daily basis, about an average person has about 70,000 thoughts go through his mind. Everything we see, everything we smell, we do, we taste, it goes through our mind. So all those 70,000 thoughts, we have to filter it through the word of God so that we are not led astray. I don't know if you ever had this, but maybe you had one thought and then it led to another one and a third, a fifth, a, a tenth thought and, and you start thinking about something that's absolutely unrelated to that first thought and you start backtracking and you see, okay, this is how I got there. Sometimes that happens and we see that maybe it wasn't even a bad thought, but it, we spend so much time thinking about something that wasn't even important. 
Back in the 1600s, uh, there was a French philosopher named uh, René Descartes who said something very famous that is still often used today. He said the following, he said, I think, therefore I am. He said, I think, therefore I am. But there's nothing innately wrong with this statement, but it's not found in the Bible. But I think if Apostle Paul would add something to this, he would say he would make it much more foundational, much more profound by adding just one, changing just one word. He would say, Apostle Paul would say something along the lines of this. He would say, I think, therefore I do. Because this is what he's saying in these two verses, except he's formulated in a little bit of a different wording. I think, therefore I do. And we'll see how the uh, relationship between thinking and doing is formed in, in these verses here. And even in the way Apostle Paul writes, often he writes, even let's look at Romans, he writes, the, uh, the first part of Romans is about practice, uh, I'm sorry, about thinking, about knowledge, about things we need to know about God, about man, about sin, about the devil. He writes about things that are related to the Holy Spirit, about everything we need to know. And then the last few chapters he writes about practice and how we need, what we need to do about that. And that's often the way Apostle Paul formulates his thinking. So in order for God to guard our hearts and minds, we need to control of what we think about. So God created human beings to be creatures of habit. And I think we all have habits that we formed, and there's also statistics that show that if you, ha you want to formulate a habit, you have to do something every day without missing it for at least three weeks. If you do something for three weeks, you will, it will basically become part of your uh, body, and you, you, part of your self, and you will do it uh, without even thinking. But if you do it for two weeks and miss a few days and then do it again for a day, a, a few weeks, you will, it will never become a habit. So for us to form good habits is very good, especially when it comes to reading the scriptures and meditating, and we will be talking about this in this sermon here. So God created us creatures of habit, and I think maybe all of us have either children or brothers and sisters that are little children, and we often play with them. Maybe we throw them up in the air and catch them, and they get really scared, but when, as soon as we let them go, they, what's the next thing they say? They do it again, right? So you throw them up and pick them up or you swing them. They say, do it again, and pretty soon you don't have enough strength because they, they want you to do it again and again. And why do children do this? They do this because they are created in the image of God. And because we know from the creation, God set things in motion, and he said, do it again. He, when the sun goes down, he says the next day, rise, and he says, do it again. And for 6,000 plus years, he's been saying, do it again. And if God would just not, not want to keep the routine that he has, we will be in a lot of trouble. So God has a routine. He has set things in motion, and that's the same way we should live. God set us as human beings that we go to work, we do the things on a, basis, a daily basis, and those are the things that will really make us who we will, who will grow up to be. Who will, if we want to be godly, we need to look at our daily lives and see what are we doing to work towards that. So today I would like to share three points that will answer the question, uh, how can we remain faithful in our daily routines? So number one is being faithful starts from controlling our thoughts. In verse 8, we just read that. Let's read it again. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We had quite a few topics about that came up in this just this letter of Philippians about our mind, about thinking, about how important that is. So this is not a new topic he's uh, introducing to us. He talk, talked about it over and over again before when he talked about not setting our mind on, uh, heavenly, on earthly things but on heavenly things. And the word that he uses here to meditate on these things, some translations say uh, dwell on these things or uh, think or consider these things. So he used the same word in the previous chapter, verse 13. 313, he said, he used a different word, but it's the same word in the original. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, 
But one thing I do, forget those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which lie ahead. So the word, I do, I do not count myself, is the same word. He could, he could have said, I do not think myself, or I do not consider myself, I do not uh, count myself to, be, to reach perfection because I am dwelling, I am uh, striving towards that. That's the goal of his life. So the word to meditate could be considered to, so we could read this um, word when we read the end, the end of verse 8. It says, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Or we could say, consider these things, uh, count these things in your life, may apply them to your life. So what does it mean when Paul says to meditate on these characteristics? Sometimes we think to meditate is some kind of mystical uh, religion of the Eastern people that they sit down and they empty their minds and they practice some kind of unfamiliar thing to us. The Christian idea of meditation is the exact opposite when instead of emptying our mind, we fill our mind with things that are true, noble, just, pure, of good report, and things that are virtuous and so on. So we, we fill our mind when we meditate instead of emptying our mind and just being open to all the vials of the enemy. So we are to meditate on these things, the things that are true, noble, just, of good report, for the purpose of being able to uh, understand the will of God in our life and to have joy and to have the strength that God will give us when we do this, when we meditate on these. And we will see as we look at these ver words specifically that they, they do not only apply to the scripture itself, they apply to our daily life. We know that the truth is found only in the Bible, but there are true things that we can think about in our lives, and there are uh, uh, false things that are all around us that we need to uh, purposely decide to not allow to enter into our minds. So God wants us to focus on our thinking. So let's look at these characteristics here mentioned. There's eight of them, and how they apply to our daily life. So the first thing he mentions is truth, or true things. So if anything is untrue, we, can, we need to purposely uh, not allow it to enter our mind, especially now with so much access to the news. A anytime we look on our phones and look anywhere, there's always two sides of the same thing. There's always something, one person says it this way, another person says it this way, and we have to determine what is true, but we need to find out. There's only one thing that is really true, that's the Holy Scriptures, but... We need to not allow the things of this world that are untrue to enter into our mind. Don't accept it and to sift it out through the, through the word of God. And then he goes on to say the next word, which is noble. The things that are noble. We see, that when we think of the word noble, it's, it's something very desirable. Something that we often think maybe of uh, the kings or queens or a princess. Somebody that's really high. Somebody that has a very somebody that is very respected in society. So we want to be like that. Think about things that are very high. Think about, I think that Ty, the connection he's trying to make is think about heavenly things of what he talked about in the previous chapter. Think about things that are in heaven, which is the most noble thing which we can think about. The opposite of noble would be dishonorable, shameful, base, uh, disrespectful things that we should not allow to enter into our mind. And then he says things that are just, just or justice or right, righteous things. So when we think about righteous things, we need to understand that we as humans are created to, to love things that are right. If we see injustice in the world, we automatically, we, we hate that. We do not like it when somebody is treated uh, wrongly. So we, we, we oftentimes want to step in when somebody is being mistreated, but we should not dwell on the things that are unjust, the things that, there's so much wicked people in the world and we oftentimes uh, focus our mind on the things that are unjust, that the things that are right, sometimes there's n not even any good news on, the, uh, on TV or anywhere else because everything is focused on the unjust. So let's focus on things that are just, the things that are right. And then the things that are pure, Purity is something that is went by the wayside in our culture. So a person that just operates in the in being in just thinking of the just and unjust, he might say, 
Well, if two people do something and they both agree on it, then it's okay, right? Because I'm not hurting anybody. But a person that operates with the idea of purity in his mind, he will say, no, it's not okay, even if these two people agree, because God says it is wrong. Just let, let's think about what Joseph did when Potiphar's wife was uh, persuading him, and she was constantly uh, talk, uh, taking uh, him and wanting him to sin with her. And we know how that happened. He, he could have just said, okay, if you agree, I agree. Let's do whatever you want. He did not say that. He purposely, he was thinking with pure thoughts in his mind. That's why he was able to flee from her and say, God does not want me because I do not want to sin against God and against your husband. So he had pure thoughts in his mind, which, uh, which caused him to avoid immorality and sexual sin. Then we think about the word lovely. The word lovely is such a beautiful word. It's a beauty, things that are beautiful around us. And when we look at God's nature, we, we see, we stand at a valley and we look at the mountains, we see the streams, we see the beautiful creation of God, the flowers. That just inspires us to do great things for God. But let's, let's turn around and look at what man sometimes does. But let's look at, we know that man... Um, Oftentimes, all the stuff that is trash, they pile up trash. If we look at a pile of trash, we know that that's not beautiful. and That will not inspire us. That's, that's something ugly. So let's not put our minds on things that are ugly. Instead, let's look at the things of God that are beautiful and pure, things that uh, inspire us to do great things for the Lord, the, thing, the creation of God. And then he goes on to say the word, of good report, things that are of good report. So this reminds me of the days when I was still in school when we would bring our report cards home. And if we got an A, A, A plus, anything good, the first thing we would do is take that piece of paper and run and show it to our parents, right? Because mom, dad, I got an A, I'm so excited. So we wanted to share that news with somebody because it was a good report. But sometimes it wasn't always that good. Sometimes we got less than what we wanted, and the first thing we would do is put that paper, crumple it up in our pocket, and hopefully our parents wouldn't ask about it because you, nobody wants to share about things that are uh, b below of what we could have done, but we, because we were slacking off, we got a bad grade. So things that are of good report are things we want to share with our pastor, share with our friends, share with our family members. If, something, if we can talk about something freely, openly, then it's something we should dwell upon. And the last two words he uses here is virtuous and praiseworthy. I think these words are actually summary words of the things that he, uh, the six words he already talked about. He kind of mentions that he groups it again into two major groups, things that are virtuous and things that are praiseworthy. Virtuous things are, can be true, noble, just, the pure things, and praiseworthy are things that or good report, lovely things that he kind of mentions these two groups and says, think about things that bring glory to our God and Father. So these, the first point we looked at is that being faithful starts from controlling our thoughts and thinking, focusing on what goes into our mind. The second point is being faithful continues by following an example. Being faithful continues by following an example, and that's what we see in the next verse. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Let's stop on this part here, the first part of verse 9. So we need to understand that there's always an example that we should follow. And Paul sets himself as an example here, and this is not the first time he already mentioned in chapter 3 that he is an example of these, uh, those that set their mind on heavenly things, th those that set their mind on earthly things are those that walk in the flesh and the enemies of the cross of Christ. So Apostle Paul sets himself as an example. And if we look at all these verses, words that we just looked at in verse 8, they can all be summarized with, with one word, which is righteousness, righteous thinking. Or even to summarize it even more, we can go and say we could think about one person, which is Jesus. If we think about Jesus, then all these thoughts 
true things, noble things, just things, pure, lovely, of good report will all be things that we will think when, if we think just about one person because he's the ultimate example of, of all these characteristics in our life. But one thing we have to understand is that Apostle Paul was not the or originator of the things that uh, he was talking about. He did not come up with this idea that how he should live. He did not make up this. Uh, he did not say, okay, because I am such a good person, follow me. He was the one that said, I have received the gospel from the Lord. I did not make it up on my own. So let, let's look at what he says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. Galatians 1, 12, he says, For I neither received it, uh, talking about the gospel, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. He did not accept it from uh, the great teachers he had, from the Pharisees, from the, uh, all those that influenced him in his life. He accepted it. He received it from Jesus Christ through the revelation when he ex revealed himself on the road to Damascus. So Apostle Paul was not someone who created his own example for us to follow. He got the example from Jesus Christ. And then he uses four words here that describe what the, the Philippian church learned from him and that this is the things that we should also learn from the example of Paul. So he says, things that you have learned, received, heard, and saw. Let's focus on these four words. So the first thing he says is things that you have learned from me. For if we look at uh, f the 11th ver verse of this chapter, he says something very similar. He says, now that I speak in regard, not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I have learned to be content. This is, contentment is not something you are born with. It's something that comes uh, because he purposely set his mind on things that are pure, things that are just, things that are noble. He didn't set his mind on the people that were stoning him or speaking false things about Paul. He purposely took that out of his mind and set his things on the heavenly things, set his mind on heavenly things. So it's things that he learned from God by the examples that Jesus left in his, in his word. And then we see the word, the next word is received. I have received. So we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. He uses the same idea, things that when he received the gospel, it was, it was a personal idea that God wanted to share the gospel with Paul because if God, if Jesus would not reveal himself to Paul, he would never have known him. So it was something very personal. He God purposely revealed the gospel to him. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that, what, hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So he says he preached the word, but it was received by you. And then he says, stand fast in that. Don't let that uh, escape from your grip because the gospel is something you have to hold on for the rest of your life because the devil wants to do everything to take it away from you. And we see how the devil is attacking so many Christians in our time, especially now when a lot of churches aren't assembling like they normally would. And the devil is trying to uh, steal the gospel and to, to sow seeds of doubt into many, many lives. And thank God that we could gather together and, and stand fast in the gospel. And the next word he uses is, it was the things which you have heard. So Paul spoke things and they heard these things. So if you look at Philippians, the first chapter of this letter, and look at verse 29, he uses the similar words to describe how he heard, how they saw and they heard the gospel. Let's read verse 29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. 
So now they, they saw it and they heard the gospel through the, through the example of Apostle Paul. And then when we look at the word saw, we already kind of talked about this when he was talking about in chapter 3, verse 17, when he was talking about setting your mind on things that are above. Or verse 19 says, those who set their mind on earthly things, but Paul purposely set his mind on heavenly things. So he, he was looking with his spiritual eyes, not on the worldly things, but on heavenly things. That's why he was able to uh, look past all the beatings he experienced, all the shipwrecks, all the, the evils that were done to him in the name of God. He was able to look past that because he was looking at heavenly things. He set his mind on heavenly things. So we have to remember that we always leave an example by our lifestyle. It will either be a good example or a bad example. It can't be a neutral example. So God calls us to be a good example. He says to uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 7, he says, in all things showing your, yourself to be a pattern of good works. So he's saying not just uh, do a good work here and there, but a pattern. That means an, a constant uh, example, always showing a good example of good works. Or we could be a bad example by our lives because Paul also says, good, uh, do not be deceived because bad co communication corrupts good manners. Or we could change one word here to fit our uh, sermon today and we could say evil thoughts corrupt good manners because everything begins with our thoughts. So evil thoughts, if we have evil thoughts, it will corrupt the good manners that we think we have, it will corrupt them and to make them even worse, and people around us will also be experiencing this corruption. So being faithful continues by following an example, and lastly, being faithful ends in having the God of peace. So there's an end to being faithful. It's having the person of God, uh, the, the God of peace with you, having God himself be with you. And that's a great blessing we have in these words that Apostle Paul gives and says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me do these, and the God of peace will be with you. So the God of peace will be our reward. We talked about this a little bit last time, that God will be our reward. He will be, we will not get some kind of physical thing. We will have, be able to have the God that revealed himself to Paul first, and then he reveals himself to us. So the God of peace being with us is made conditional upon pr us practicing these things. So he says, do these things, and then the God of peace will be with you. So he says, the things that you learned and the things you saw, these do. But the, before we can do this, we have to set our mind on the things that are true, just, noble, and pure, right? And then he says, if you do this, then God will be with you. So let's look at what Jesus says about this in John 14, 21. Jesus says the following. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and mani manifest myself to him. Just focus on this part right here where it says, the middle of this verse, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. What a great uh, promise we have here that if we love Jesus, the Father will love us. So somebody might say, well, God loved us before the foundation of the world. How could God love us anymore? But look at how this is. I think when God talks about loving us before the foundation of the world, he, he's saying that he loved us to save us from our sin. But once we love Jesus Christ, he loves us in a much more personal way that he becomes, uh, uh, he, he who loves me will be loved by my father, a very personal, uh, he, he becomes a personal savior. And what a wonderful verse, verse this is that he will love and he will reveal himself. He will make manifest himself. So practice these things and you will enjoy the presence of our Lord. The presence of the God of peace. And then the next thing is we see that the God of peace will make the church a good example in this dark world. We see that 
the God of peace is, does not normal, only work with one person. He works corporately with the whole church. He wants everybody in the church to be a good example. So whenever the church is, walks in unity, that's a very good example to the dark world around us. But when there's disunity and confusion, that's when we have a, show a bad example to the world around us. Look, look at what he says to the church of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 14.33 this is a familiar verse to, to us. It says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, and as is in all the churches of God. So God, he kind of contrasts confusion with peace. So God is the God of peace who does not want confusion because he wants unity. He wants us to unite against, around Jesus Christ and to unite the, around the things that are that are. Not the things that are different in us, but the things that are, that are common in us. Because we all have differences. We all have different lifestyles. We all grew up in different homes. But we all have one common thing, which is our need for Jesus Christ and our need to focus on him and trust in him because he alone can help us live, live this godly life. And also a, a verse that is very close to me is in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. This is also a reference to the God of peace. We'll, we, we'll see a few verses about the God of peace, which last time we talked about the peace of God, and this time we we're talking about the God of peace himself. So it's a little different in the sense that we are having God himself. This is such a close relationship with the God of peace, not the God of war, but the God of peace who wants to give us peace in our hearts and in our lives and in the world around us. So Hebrews 13.20 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd and the sheep, shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, and then look at verse 21, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom all be all glory, forever and ever, amen. To make you complete in every good work. This is the work that only God can uh, work in us. I mean, something that has to be done by God himself, but we have to allow him. When we have the, the proper thinking in our mind, it will, God will be able to work these works through us, the good works, because he will, um, if there is room for the devil in our mind, then God will not be able to work through us if we allow the devil to sow wicked things in our mind. And lastly, before we pray, I would like to look at that, the fact that God will soon crush the devil underfoot, as he says in Romans 16, 20. This is a very powerful verse where Apostle Paul says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underfoot. He will crush him and we know that God will protect his children from being led astray because he will not let the devil sow these uh, evil thoughts into our minds. We know that God will crush Satan in the end when he will throw him into the lake of fire. But I think this is even more, we don't have to wait for that time. We can, even now, whenever we, if we allow God to control our thoughts and we focus on God and we live for him, then even now he will crush Satan underfoot and the devil will not have a foothold in our lives. That's why it's so important to not allow our minds to drift. So in conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, today we learned that even with our minds we can exercise love for God. So that even if we don't do anything physically, but just with our minds, we can show that we love God. We can show him that he's important to us and that we want to please him with our thought life and that we should shape our thinking in the kind of thinking that is according to the peace of God. So the question today as we go and before we pray is, can, we, can people around us see the blessings of God that are flowing through us, through the ordinary things that we sometimes we call mundane. Sometimes people live the whole week just to get to Friday night and Saturday, just to live to the weekend. Or do we live every day as a gift from him, 
because we do not know well, whether we will have next, next month. We do not know if we will be able to have another English service in the future because right now is the day of salvation. The Lord wants us to live for him today. So as we close this message, let us pray and offer our thanksgiving to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.